All right, how about molecular machines? Molecular machines, take a look at this. As you've probably seen this quote, according to Charles Darwin, uh, Darwinism's dead. If it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight changes, my theory would absolutely break down. And of course, sort of the mascot of the intelligent design movement is the bacterial flagellum. And if you take a look at the bacterial flagellum, it's the width of an E. coli bacterium cell, which is uh, about one one thousandth the width of a human hair. So you can line up 12,500 in an inch of these things. It has 240 distinct proteins. It has a microscopic outboard motor on its tail that runs at an incredible 100,000 revolutions per minute. This is a little motor here. And it only takes a quarter turn to stop, shift directions, and start spinning 100,000 RPMs in the opposite direction. I don't even know if we have a motor that can do that ourselves. And it's irreducibly complex. It must have been created all at once because you can't have function of a motor as it's being put together. The whole motor needs to be there at the same time in order for you to have function. Yeah, you can build a car in successive steps, but you can't drive your car when it's halfway built, right? And Ken Miller and other so-called uh, critics of this will try and say they have a precursor to this, but they really don't. They don't have a functional precursor to this. In fact, when you look at this, if this isn't something engineered, I don't know what is. You've got a propeller. You've got bushings with L-rings, P-rings. You've got membranes, hooks, universal joints. You've got a rotor with an S-ring and an M-ring. You've got studs, a stator. You've got all this stuff, which is really an engineered creation. It's not something that could come into existence. In can, can you define irreducible complexity for us so we, oh, yeah, okay. we, we, we see why this is uh, so critical to the Darwinian enterprise? An irreducibly complex system or creation, whatever it is, whatever you're talking about, has to have all the parts in working order at the right place at the right time in order to have function. Uh, the, the, the illustration that Michael Behe gives is the mousetrap, right? You've got to have all five parts of the mousetrap there in order to catch mice. Uh, yeah, you could have a precursor to a mousetrap, but it wouldn't catch mice if you took some of the parts away. You need to have all the parts there in working order together at the same time in order to have function. Do you have a different definition? That no, no, it's just because mm -hmm. the Darwinian model requires that uh, each piece be added little by little, and at each stage you have increased functionality. Yes. With irreducible complexity, you have functionality at no stage of the building of the thing until you have the whole thing built. So when you have a bona fide irreducibly complex feature in the biological realm, there is no Darwinian way to explain how the pieces get assembled to the functional state. And what uh, guys like Miller want to say is that there must be some functionality to the preliminary states mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, that then, uh, then, then leads you to this final sophisticated state we see here. But of course, th there must be only if you're presuming the materialistic explanations. If you're going with the evidence as, it, as we're facing it, we are free then to just uh, deposit the most obvious explanation, this is designed. They are not free to do that because they are restricted by their philosophical presuppositions, so they have to demand that there must be uh, some functionality to these prior stages, and this is the demand that they force upon the argument mm -hmm. to disqualify the, uh, the conclusions of irreducible complexity. Now, a conclusion of an irreducibly complex system is what Michael Behe takes, because he wrote the book on this, and here's what he says. He says, the result of these cumulative efforts to investigate the cell, to investigate life at the molecular level, is a loud, clear, piercing cry of design. The result is so unambiguous and so significant that it must be ranked as one of the greatest achievements in the history of science. The discovery rivals those of Newton and Einstein. Now, is he just seeing what he wants to see? I'll let you decide that. Science doesn't say anything scientists do. I think he's drawing the proper conclusion based on the evidence, but that's for you to decide. Question. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Uh, I, you want me to go back there? <clears throat> there is a, it, it, it's not unusual to hear people say that Behe has been completely refuted on this point. And when you look at the details, what you discover is that someone has taken an example 
of alleged irreducible complexity, and then they have contrived an explanation, and it may be a clever explanation that is worth looking into. I'm not dismissing it. But they've contrived an explanation how that particular piece of machinery can be explained by some kind of step-by-step -step process in which each step has uh, functionality. It's a possibility, in, but it's not evidence. It, well, it's a possibility, yeah, and that's okay because yeah. scientists right. have to do that. That's part of what they do. They, they tell stories and then try to f find uh, evidence that the story, that things played out the way they think they do. So I'm not faulting the process. I'm making a little different point. Let's even just say for the sake of discussion that they have done a, a convincing job of giving us a materialistic explanation to demonstrate that one alleged example of irreducibly irreducible complexity is not in fact irreducibly complex but then they take that to be a refutation of the entire point in every example of irreducibly complex machines in the biological realm I've seen this time and time again oh he's been completely disproved how so well because this uh, flagellum thing well we found a way to explain that in Darwinian terms so there he goes as if the flagellum is the only Mm -hmm. example of mm -hmm. an irreducibly complex thing. Mm -hmm. And as B.E. points out, and the people in the field know, the biological realm is absolutely littered with these mm -hmm. kinds of things. Mm -hmm. In every single cell you see these kinds of things. And uh, just in, in the replication process of the DNA and how, how the DNA uh, helps make proteins, assemble proteins, there's all kinds of little machines that are involved in that process. And by explaining away one of the machines in this vast array of them, you have not defeated the argument of irreducible complexity. You've just removed supposedly one example of irreducible complexity. You know, William Dembski makes the point that the irreducible complexity argument on steroids is the origin of life. Because for the origin of life, you need a cell, you need DNA, you need RNA, and you need proteins. And all four of those things need one another. They have to all be there together to have any of them in a living thing. Uh, DNA needs RNA, RNA needs DNA, a cell needs both of them, proteins need, they, they, all, they all go together. It's a chicken, a classic chicken and egg problem. I mean, that's the, that's, the, that's the irreducible complex problem on steroids. That's why even Dawkins will just speculate on the beginning, the origin of life. Uh, but then when you look at how life functions here and you're trying to reverse engineer things, interesting word, reverse engineer, right? <laughs> this stuff's engineered. You're trying to figure out how is it put together by randomness. I think the, ultimately it's futile to try and figure that out because it doesn't appear to be put together by randomness. Now, by the way, before we go into the fossil record, last thing, can you continue to look for a natural cause for life? Yeah, you can continue to look for it if you want to. But when does a question become closed. At what point do you finally say, look, we've been looking long enough. When are we going to finally say it, information doesn't appear to have any natural cause, natural forces, all the natural forces we know just create repetitive things over and over again. When are we going to finally admit that there's got to be intelligence introduced somewhere, somehow, in this process? Every knee will bow. <laughs> huh? When every knee will bow. When, when every knee will <laughs> bow, maybe. That's it. I don't know. But based on the information we have now, the best explanation is there was intelligence put in it at some point. Mm -hmm. but, and can I underscore something Please. that you that you implicit you implied here, mm -hmm. and this is something that Stephen Meyer makes as a very, very strong point. The task here isn't just looking around a little bit longer to see if we can find the right stuff. It has to do with the nature of the enterprise itself. Uh, biochemical predestination is dead in the water because it can't produce information. They know that. So there's only a couple of avenues that the materialist can go that he has at disposal to explain information. And it turns out that the nature of information itself cannot be explained by those kinds of things. And so you run into a dead end because, not because, uh, well, I haven't yet found the little piece of information to explain it. It's because of the kinds of things that you're trying to bring together. So could we say, Greg, in your opinion, that this is a category mistake? Yes. That it, it's, it's a, um, it's not a the God of the gaps argument anymore either because nature itself can't explain immaterial realities known as... It, it, Exactly. Okay. You're, you're trying to find a materialistic explanation for the existence of immaterial stuff 
information, which your philosophy, first of all, can't explain how you get something immaterial from something material, but it also, your philosophy denies the existence of Im immaterial things to begin with. That's right. <laughs> so so it's, it's just in principle not mm -hmm. capable of solving this problem. But then just like that, the atheist could be right. <laughs> that's what he's famous for saying. That's not me. I Is that Tom? Yeah, that's Tom. No, I think you're right on it. It's just, it's a different category. It's like trying to find a, a natural cause for all of nature. Trying to find a natural cause for information when we know information's immaterial.